Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Kevin Sledge, and let's talk horror. Now, today I am joined by the amazing Justin Wellborn. Justin, how you doing today, man? I'm great, man. This is super, super exciting for me to be able to work with you. I'm a big fan of yours. Um, for those of you that don't know everything he's been a part of, uh, originally <laughs> from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, he's lived in L.A. for over a decade now, uh, working in film and television. Um, real quick, I do want to know, because working in film and working in television are two completely different animals. While, yes, you're both on the TV or the iPad or the computer, whatever, they are completely different animals when it comes to the filming and the uh, promotion process. Which one are you more keen on doing? Do you prefer film roles or television roles? You know, it, it's been so redefined with streaming um, because when I kind of got here, it very quickly became like going out for guest stars, which I've done, you know, uh, one episode guest stars and things like that, which which is the bread and butter of uh, of the industry. And you definitely like, you know, they lay out money for a day or two. And it's a great job to have, man, go up to the Disney ranch and film on a fake city all day. Um, and right. when I got on Justified, that was a whole new experience, uh, much like streaming in the way that you're just you're there for a while and you can really build on who you are in the show and get to know who's doing it. You don't, you're not so much a Merc showing up and just doing the, right. you know, the, the day's work um, with the stars of the show, you actually get to participate in it. But, you know, movies have always been something, I mean, independent movies in Atlanta stemmed from doing theater together and creating short films for 48 hour film festivals for independent commercials. So all of it is really tied up together um, in, in, in my uh, estimation, because we just started out, you know, making movies where somebody would call you up and go, Hey man, I can give you $250, $300 maybe, or, for my movie, The Signal, I mean, they promised me 600 bucks for 12 days work and a point in the movie. And I, I had to have that explained to me at the time. That's how in theater I was as far as like, you know, I, I don't know what this is. And of course, it's based on the success of the film. And what's, you know, the amazing story is, you know, we took this $50,000 movie and went to Sundance. It's the only film festival that took us, which is super strange. We played the first horror movie on the night. None of us had seen it except the directors and producers. So it's me and the, you know, eighth row and MC Hammer is behind me and you're just watching your movie. <laughs> and in the first, you know, 15, 20 minutes, man, people were leaving the movie theater and we were like, oh my God, they hate it screw it we'll just you know go on from here and we'll enjoy our movie and blah 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 but uh there was a bidding war going on for it they were literally by you know midnight movie and by 4 30 or 5 in the morning we had sold the film for several million dollars and you know that was when i came home uh it's the first time i ever called my parents drunk uh and <laughs> was like i told you i'd be somebody um and then um and then, yeah, I got home and I was laying bricks for my roommate. And I was like, I have a college degree. I'm at the top of my game here in town and something's got to change. And so getting into film was my first real uh, doing independent film. And then and, and then just going to these agents who for a couple of years have been like, hey, man, anytime you don't want to do Shakespeare, you might want to get into film, let us know. And so I started that. And a year later, the day that The Signal came out in a few theaters around America was the day that I got Final Destination. And if you if you don't follow those sort of paths in this kind of weird rejection, faith oriented business, you're not listening. So, but then again, when I got here and began doing TV and realized how fast one job kind of became the other or could, because you've been proven on this and certainly after Justified, uh, you know, I, I really began to appreciate more of the TV medium and, you know, all the people that really work that. It's basically film on speed. I mean, you got to get it done today, you know, that we've got a set right. schedule for how long these episodes are. And uh, but doing something like Godless for streaming. I was in New Mexico for three and a half months, you know, and you get to know the place and the people and right. your horse and the, you know, you, you're there a week living in your trailer and then they call you up for a big shootout or riding that damn horse across a mile straight of desert, you know, and you're just like, um, 
please don't throw me off, you know? So it's got its own challenges, but I really like all of them. I will say that over the pandemic, uh, you know, when you start thinking about things that you want to do, uh, theater was the thing that kept coming back. And it, it was really unfortunate that, you know, the the one other thing I really wanted to do was also closed. So, um, You know, that's led me to doing some podcasting and stuff like that. Been really trying to spread out what defines being a film, TV, um, uh, internet artist of of whatever kind, you know. And it all comes back to creating work. Your work on the show. I mean, most of the time you go on a show and people are like, you already got the job. Do you? You know, we want you. On a film, you have more time to craft it. And, And rarely on a show. You know, do, do you have that opportunity unless you're on it for a while, you know? Right. Well, and what I love about this is you already talked about how, you know, some of the shows that you've been a part of, like Justified, you know, that's a huge show. And, you know, you being Carl on that and then Godless, like that's a whole different thing. But you've also done guest spots on like NCIS, Hawaii Five-O, iCarly. You know, there are other shows that you've been a part of. But when it comes to film, you know, some of these films that you're in that I'm obviously the Final Destination, the fourth one, for those of you trying to keep the score. Um you played a vile character, man. And from the oh yeah, what people, what people don't get is like, b- before I do this interview, I've been talking to you for weeks already, <laughs> and you are one of the most genuine, kind people. So, you know, thanks, after, man. After being able to have these conversations I've had with you outside of the podcast, it really makes me appreciate you more as an actor that you were able to play such a repulsive human being in that film, and play it so well, you know, very convincingly. But that's not you at all. You know, just from the, you know, we've been, like I said, we've been hanging out talking for a couple of weeks you know, on and off, and that's not who you are. So if you'd be able to go in there and nail a role like that, you know, people look at you and like, I fucking hate that guy. And you're like, no, you yeah. love that guy <laughs> because he did his job to make you that guy. So, um, I mean, I, I work real hard at, at, at being a, uh, uh, playing a bad guy, but being a good man as much as possible. I believe that that's, you know, I mean, nobody's perfect and we've all had our past, but at the same time, I've, I've worked really hard to, uh, to establish that difference. I mean, when I was a little kid on my list of like three things to become, uh, actor was one of them and super villain was the other. And uh, I think I wanted to be a lawyer, but it was because of lawyers on TV that I had seen and they seemed to live with a great life. So really, I just wanted to be an actor and a villain. So... <laughs> I was going to say, so you either want to be an actor or two different types of super villains. I get it. Basically, um, babe, I, I, <laughs> of the three, I didn't become a lawyer. So, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, um, well, I mean, and not just that, but you, is it hard for you to harness that almost pure evil embodiment as a human being when you get, you know, you get a role like that? Is it hard for you to come across as this super douchebag when you're really not? You know, there's so much i mean i i am a lover of film and tv and 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 bad guys are typically more interesting to me because they have to be the exact balance of what the hero is and often they've got good reasons for who they are um i i will definitely say i enjoy going to those places for some of those things but like in final destination i mean on my on the door of my trailer was the word racist you know um right. i mean I'm, I'm wearing swastikas and ss and stuff like and that stuff's really powerful um i've done things like when i'm doing that i read schindler's list and 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 did a lot of things to kind of for my own soul to kind of offset that because while you're going to those places and saying these things like to michael t and you know the others it sucks but yeah. You know, I got to be on Good Lord Bird and, you know, you're a Southern racist, you know, in the Civil War and hunting down slaves or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, you've got to say those things like it's like it's part of your world because it is part of that world. And luckily in the show, of course, it's, you know, you get your comeuppance and all that. And certainly if I'm a destination, you get your comeuppance. Um, I'll say the hardest thing is when you've got to do something like hurt one of your cast members, you know, do violence upon them and uh, when they're helpless, especially uh, I've done some indie movies where like, you know, a woman's helpless or something like that. And that's your friend. And they're 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 right there with you and they're in the place. But man, when it call, you know, cut gets called, you want to get a coat on that person. You want to. Are you OK? OK. And that's the stuff I've definitely come home and been like, 
get this off me. This sucks, man. I don't want to be this person. I'm not this person. It's just an act. And they're usually much better off than I am because you're the one instigating this horrible thing on them. Um, but yeah, I mean, it can take its toll, but for the most part, there's a great joy in being able to uh, mine some of those places and, uh, you know, try and find a real source for it. Um, places so like uh, In Siren, Mr. Nick's, I got more of a chance. You know, my, my independent film stuff with Greg Bishop and with David Bruckner, I'm able to, I mean, I think The Signal, the, that, that first movie is like one of the only ones I play a hero in, <laughs> you know, and even that I'm kind of a jerk. Uh, so, um, yeah, yeah, it, it's, it, it takes its toll, but it's, it's worthwhile. It's the good stuff. Well, I mean, not just that, but we've also seen you in other horror movies that we all love, like Dance of the Dead, The Creed, yeah. like I was telling you, one of my favorite remakes of all time. Um, is it weird for you still, like when people come up to you and are like, oh my gosh, you're in this film that I just absolutely love and like, is that still a weird feeling to you or have you kind of got to the point where you're it's like, always great to hear no matter what it is. I mean, I, I, the crazies was really hard to make. It took a lot of time. It was, you know, we did some reshoots in Iowa. I thought it was going to be two days. I was there two weeks, you know, there's nothing to do out in the middle of that corn, uh, but just hang out and, um, you know, hope that they get your rental car eventually. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I love hearing that that people enjoy the work um i mean i've even dated people that didn't realize that they had seen me in movies uh until like way after <laughs> like oh my god i love that movie that was you and you're like we have been together for months uh so yeah yeah that's that's good i love hearing it and when i came to la you know you go to the samuel french bookstore or, or the guy at the rental car and he says you know, he recognizes you from something. That's the stuff that is just as good as going to a festival and having people recognize you for the work. It's just some guy that loves you from Final Destination, man, or the crazies or Dance the Dead or any of that stuff. Yeah. Which is so awesome, man. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty great, world. man. I mean, why else would you do it? Yeah. I, I can only imagine, man. I'm so happy and proud of you when you get to have these moments. I think it's something we've all, like you said, growing up, something we've all kind of wanted. Um, now, yeah, before we get to the reason why you're here, Justin, I do want to talk real quick. Um, you are producing a brand new podcast. Can you talk to everybody about what you're doing there? Yeah. Um, and this is actually, I've been working with my friend, Jimmy Mack, who is from New Orleans, but just about a year ago, moved out here. His wife's getting her sound engineering degree. And, and uh, he is one of the greatest playwrights and directors I've ever known. I've known him since college. And we, I would go down to New Orleans and we do theater together for years. And uh, since he's moved out here, he is on the Dave Nemo show on Sirius XM and Dave Nemo weekends. And uh, he's, they've got a huge audience. And Jim is, uh, th Jimmy has thrown this idea around about a combination uh, horror adventure podcast that is uh, in the vein of Snake Plissken, Jack Burton, Chris Christopherson from Convoy, and it's yeah. called Snake Poncha Trains, places you wouldn't want to go unless you're with Snake Poncha Train. So Snake Poncha Train for short, and uh, we've mixed in a lot of H.P. Uh, Lovecraft tropes that we love, and uh, we just... Um, recorded the full season of uh, Shadow Out of Service, is what it's called. And uh, we've got a lot of smaller episodes. They're sort of x files -y. He goes someplace that's real, and then we kind of play with that idea, and we call those snake bites. And uh, we've got about three or four seasons planned out. And just because of the three days that I produced and that we all put together and brought some of my favorite people in real quick, um, They've offered us space on, um, uh, you know, most weeks for he and I to come in and make another show. So we're going to talk about books and movies and how that, uh, you know, connects to the transportation industry in the world. And, but it's everything from, again, Big Trouble in Little China, Convoy, The Wild Bunch, you know, things that connect to all of that stuff that we love because we've got a lot of popular media that we dig and and he and I you know talking is one of our fortes so <laughs> getting together and and just shooting the shit for a while is uh is right up there so I'm excited about the pre-scripted one but I'm also really excited we start recording next week on um 
I don't even think we have a name for the show yet, but it'll be on Sirius XM subscribers. And then uh, we'll start looking for sponsors and all that stuff. You know, it's just throwing new curves into the game, you know, and I really love and always have creating new work. And yeah. this is the sort of thing that, I mean, podcasting has not gotten smaller. It's gotten bigger. It's created whole new careers. You know, my friend Henry Zabrowski from Last Podcast on the Left, you know, he did a huge show on Cartoon Network. You know, your pretty face is going to hell. And yet the podcast is bigger than than even that, you know, yeah. and it's remarkable that uh, you can make a living or part of a living doing, uh, you know, some of that stuff. And yeah, I'm excited about it and whatever yeah, comes. I, to- I'm telling you, as someone that does it, no better feeling. I love doing this. It's a blast. I enjoy every single guest that I get to talk to because we get to talk about horror movies. And, you know, yeah. you're in horror movies, man. Dance of the Dead, The Crazies, Signal, The Final Destination. But in order for you to be a part of that world, it had to start somewhere, Justin. So now, my friend, I'd like to go back to the past. Talk yeah. About how horror started for you, your first horror movie. And Justin, the first horror movie you watched was Dreamscape. And I got to tell you, I mean, I'm 100% transparent all the time. This is the first time I've gotten to talk about this movie, and I am super excited. So, Me um, too. Do you remember about how old you were the first time you had seen it? I was either seven or eight, I believe, which definitely dates me. Um, uh, 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 caveat, my mother says that my first horror movie was Sleeping Beauty, but I was like one or one and a half. And she said it was the witch that I was just inconsolably terrified of. I don't remember that, though. What I do remember is that I had such an imagination that I couldn't watch a lot of horror movies like, you know, people would bring home Friday the 13th. I could watch like a minute or two of that before I was just under the covers. No way. Couldn't do it. Um, What business a six or seven year old had watching Friday the 13th. That was the 80s and so forth. Um, But uh, yeah, Dreamscape is the one that I remember seeing and having just watched it twice again for this show um really just i remember the movie vividly and i remember i could not sleep and crawled into bed with my parents after the movie and that's the last time that happened and the it just terrified me on levels that things like freddy krueger and jason didn't really do later on those scared me but right. Dreamscape's pretty psychologically damaging. <laughs> I was just going to say, Dreamscape is out there. And the good thing is, if you guys haven't seen Dreamscape, I have a link to it down here in the description. So that way you can go check it out. It's free on YouTube. And I should have said this earlier, but I also have all of Justin's social media links down here in the description. Oh, so yeah. You're giving him a follow. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But you're going to want to follow him on social media, especially if you yourself do a podcast. So, um we know how old you were when you watched it for the first time, but do you remember which scene it was from Dreamscape that affected you the most? Okay, definitely the snake was something that threw it out there for me, and that's what most people remember. But honestly, it's the post-apocalyptic stuff. It is the nuclear holocaust stuff in the movie. That's what terrified me. The tr- when they're on the train at the end and everybody's all mutated and, the, and, and David Patrick Kelly has gotten on there and he's not just quipping. He's actually turned himself into a mutant. He's like, you're the one that did it. You're the one that pressed the button. That zombie mutant stuff in the post-apocalyptic wasteland and in the it, it's the 80s. It's still very much Russia, America, blah. And I mean, uh, up till, you know, being a teenager, I remember having post-apocalyptic dreams that were terrifying to me. And that was the visualization that um, from that movie that I remember terrifying me the most was just how terrible um, the idea of the whole world being on fire, the whole world being destroyed. And yeah. Yeah. Well, especially when we're young men or young women like that, you know, when we're at that very impressionable age, the thought of death is so terrifying at that age. Um, yeah, it's completely have- foreign, too. You can't really, yeah. I mean, I, I, my niece is seven. 
And I look at her, I'm like, you're so sweet and small. And uh, why would I ever? But it was a different time. We were able to expose ourselves to different things. And somehow that movie was able to get inside my eyeballs and inside my head. And so, yeah, that uh, it scared me. <laughs> and I, I get it, man. And it's, it's amazing because what how this movie scared you but yeah how you were still able to connect with horror i think is so great now i don't know if you have an answer for this question because you were quite young when you watched it we know that it was very scary to you but did you have a favorite scene from the film yeah totally uh it's the um it's once again david patrick kelly and this may go to my like loving villains uh it's when he says i saw enter the dragon six times and he he gets the nunchucks and they're glowing and that's him, though. He's doing the work. I mean, having just seen it again, I'm like, he's doing that night joke work. That's fantastic, you know? So it really was cool that he was a, a, a dream ninja, you know? He was a dream martial arts. That was awesome to me. Um, not necessarily scary so much as it was just like, what an idea, you know? I had certainly never thought about that, but a dream assassin. And that's really where he manifested most in his you know in his actual form and not uh you know snake guy or whatever <laughs> well it's another thing where as a kid too you know we're watching ninja turtles you know so we see nunchucks and we're like oh michelangelo you know like that's the first still to this day when i see someone with nunchucks the first thing that pops in my brain is michelangelo every single time so sure the movie is young men and you see this your mind automatically oh i can connect to this this is something i can understand this isn't foreign so I can understand why that scene would have stuck with you as such a young child. I'm positive my dad sawed a broom in half, put two, bored two holes, put two nails and got chained. My first nunchucks were homemade, like, yeah, I got bang. Ah, oh, oh, ah, I mean, it, it was <laughs> totally allowable to make your kid a pair of nunchucks at that point. <laughs> and nobody <laughs> thought it. Everybody was really into it, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so sick, dude. It's amazing how, you know, we look back at how hard, you know, our generation's fathers were a little bit harder on us, but they did do awesome things like that that we'll always remember too. Like, oh, you want a pair of nunchucks? Let me make you a pair of nunchucks for yourself. And they're not going to be totally hard, so you won't kill yourself with them, but you'll know that I care. You know, so oh yeah, man! My dad built a wooden spaceship for my Star Wars figures before there were any vehicles. You know, that's the sort of thing that, like, wow. You know, what, a, what, what, a, what an amazing thing uh, that, yeah. that, that this is all before Atari or right there at the time that you're, you're, you're getting it. So, you know. <laughs> that's so rad, dude. So uh, another thing that's big in Hollywood right now um, is the remake, the requel, the sequel, the prequel. Um, is Dreamscape a movie that you would like to see remade today? You know, I was thinking about that and I'm amazed it hasn't been. It's such a, you know, like easy horror idea. It totally plays into the deep state espionage. It, I mean, the president apparently, uh, you know, definitely gets around with some badly suited people in Cadillac. So, you know, yeah. like <laughs> you, you don't have to do it period but it would be interesting to redo it that way um i'd love to see dennis quaid play something in it that would be amazing um i just think it's a cool idea and especially with all the technology we have i mean it, just what you could do with it and, and later on you know things like jacob's ladder i mean i remember specifically that movie really being impressionable to me in the same kind of way the dreamscape was because of the way it's shot, the way it slows things down, the way it hazes the lens, the way it takes chances uh, in, in the way that you get to watch the film. You're in dream logic. And uh, I think it'd be fun, you know, uh, yeah. it doesn't have to be quite as, you know, 80s ish as, as it was. I, I, I think with all the remakes they've made, I'm, I'm pretty surprised that's not one of them. Right. And I agree with you. I would love to see something like this that didn't get the huge, you know, theatrical release and, you know, this huge cult following, which it does have quite a cult following, I've come to realize. Really? See something like this can wow. be made so that we can have people that go back and rewatch this one. That's a, a really big positive about remake no one talks about is when you get a movie remade, people that have never seen the original always go back and watch it. So we can build an audience for this original film, through, or even if the remake's bad it may introduce 100,000 new people to the old, re to the original that no one had ever seen before. 100%, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, uh, oh. A Star is Born winning all these awards. That took me back to the Chris Christopherson of Star is Born, which I didn't know at the time, you know? I mean, you just, you find those things. Uh, when I was a little kid, I listened to Weird Al Yankovic, and he's the one that taught me the real songs so that I could go and find the real bands that he was doing parodies of. So however uh, you get there, I think is super great um, and, and, and very valuable. Um, I'm not sure if we need to meet you know make dreamscape but with all the content coming out why not you know if you can remake right. the wizard of oz sure let's remake <laughs> any number of those and horror movies specifically um i mean we get into it because usually they make money they're cheaper yeah they're a you're able to make a movie and then make another movie and that's great it gives younger filmmakers and things like that a chance and, and older filmmakers a chance to make a vision that they maybe haven't accomplished yet, you know? So who knows? Right. Well, and, and what I agree with you, what you just said there is like with horror films, people underestimate. Look at what Prey just did on Hulu. You know, it broke weekend records on Hulu, you know, and this Predator prequel, you know, and everybody's like, oh my gosh, this is breaking records on Hulu. Yeah, you should have gave it a theatrical release, asshole. You would have broke records there too. Like, so yeah, people need to stop underestimating horror so much. Now, we know justin about your first horror movie and how that affected you being dreamscape but now i want to throw a little bit of a curveball here at you for a second my little okay. buddy ghost face is here and he's got a question for you what's your favorite scary movie justin what is your favorite <laughs> horror movie of all time my favorite horror movie of all time wow that one's rough um like dawn of the dead I mean, I, I'd love to say that it's a classic Night of the Living Dead, but zombies have always been my thing, post-apocalyptic things. And once again, I think movies like Dreamscape interested me in the idea of like, and then the whole world goes to hell or hell comes back to life. You know, um, I think I was old enough when I saw Dawn of the Dead that I could get much of what George was doing in it. I could get the consumerism. It wasn't just a zombie film, but I also saw the wild and crazy Tom Savini and, you know, they're just in the mall and motorcycles and all that kind of weird Mad Max stuff. So probably Dawn of the Dead. Um, I mean, there's so many that I really love, um, but that, that one is definitely, oof, you get it in color, you get the, you know, the horrifying, your friend turning and, you know, just yeah. barely getting out and all, all those great tropes that um, hiding away. I mean, I definitely have had nightmares of zombies for long, long periods of my life. And the whole idea of being quiet so they don't hear you or going all out so you take care of them right then, you know, has always been really interesting to me. But close after that is Return of the Living Dead because I saw them about at the same time. And that is just what an 80s movie man i mean that is just this is not a costume it's a lifestyle and i just i gotta live like that you know it's just so the great most punk rock soundtrack of all time that, and that's, that's why man i mean it's a fourth of july movie it's got a nuclear holocaust at the end and it rains send more cops send more paramedics all these great yeah. actors you know that have just been in so many things that are just doing this wonderful job with a bunch of punks uh you know hanging out in the graveyard and it all goes to hell man yeah yeah man. yeah I, I love return of the living dead so. yeah of course I've, I've had an amazing time with you justin learning how horror started for you and what your favorite horror movie was but before i let you go we always end this with the same question we're gonna bounce back to dreamscape and i think i know the answer but according to my script i have to ask the question what we're gonna do is we're gonna rank this movie on a skull count now, we're not ranking Dreamscape on acting, production, score, direction, nothing like that. What we're doing here, Justin, is strictly ranking this movie on how much it affected you on first viewing. So, zero skulls being not effective, five being extremely effective. You can use half and quarter skulls anywhere in the middle. Uh, what would your ranking of Dreamscape be? I think a good four being that it literally drove me into my parents' bed to hide and try and seek comfort. I think a good four because five is really real life scary things, I think, uh, as far as like my own imagination or things that have happened in your life that really, really affected you. But definitely four because it, um, it, it made an impression. It, when we started talking, that was the one that I was like, 
it just popped back into my mind is like, wow, that that's the one, you know, anything else I just seen snippets of or didn't remember or whatever, but uh, that's the one I remember through and through. So yeah. good four, four skulls. And that's, that's a perfect ranking. So I talked earlier about uh, Justin on social media. Now, if you are a fellow podcaster or you do a video podcast here on YouTube, I have social media links down here in the description. Make sure you're hitting him up. He's one of the most genuine, kind guys I know, and I know that he would love to come out and hang out with you so you can learn more about him, and he can just spread the word about how fucking rad he is. So uh, make sure you're clicking these links down here in the description. If you don't do a podcast, follow him just so you can get updated on everything he's doing. Um, Justin, don't go anywhere, man. I got a couple more questions for you. Uh, everybody else, as always, keep talking horror. Stay what you are. And we'll see you guys soon. Oh, 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 oh,